Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I am Sherry Crute, uh, Director of Communication at the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation, NICM. Um, and today we're going to talk about one of the hottest topics in healthcare, uh, artificial intelligence tools, in this case, algorithms, and how they impact access to treatment um, and other types of care. Using AI data that includes race as a factor, or correcting for race as it's sometimes called, is a recent practice that has influenced care across many medical specialties, including cardiology, obstetrics, uh, urology. One of the best known instances was nephrology, uh, the treatment of kidney disease. In each of these cases, the intent was to use AI to improve the care people received. Yet, in many instances, the unintentional effect has been to increase existing racial disparities and inequities in healthcare, especially among Black and Latino patient populations. A recent NICM funded study conducted by Ziad Obermeyer and published in the journal Science revealed a powerful example of this type of effect. Obermeyer and his colleagues found that an algorithm widely used by American hospitals to determine who needed care was systematically discriminating against Black patients, millions of Black patients. The algorithm was less likely to refer Black patients for needed treatment than white patients, even though that, that study group of Black patients had roughly 26% more chronic conditions. The algorithm was not designed to discriminate based on race. It was created to assess healthcare needs based on healthcare costs and expenditures. The inputs into the system, however, showed lower costs for the black patients, even though they were sicker than the white population, resulting in them uh, going without needed care for a number of chronic illnesses. Addressing problems like these um, is critical as AI is clearly the future of, of healthcare. The expert speakers we have with us today are going to do exactly that. They're going to help us understand how AI tools like these unintentionally exacerbate the impact of existing racial disparities um, and racism in the practice of medicine, how companies are changing um, to address this problem, and what solutions we can put in place to provide better care to absolutely everyone. Um, this webinar is the fifth in our NICM series, Stopping the Other Pandemic, Systemic Racism and Health, in which we explore the links between racism and health and equities in Black, Latino, Native American, and other underserved communities in the United States. But before we hear from our speakers, I want to thank NICM's president and CEO, Nancy Chockley, and the NICM team who helped us curate and pull together uh, today's event. In addition, if you go to our website, nickham.org, you can get full biographies on all of our speakers along with today's agenda um, and their slides. And we also invite you to live tweet during our webinar using the hashtag AI and health equity spelled out, AI and health equity. Um, we will also take as many questions as time will allow after all of our speakers have finished their presentation. Um, I am now pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. David Jones. Dr. Jones is the Ackerman Professor of the Culture of Medicine at Harvard University. His research has explored the causes and meanings of health inequalities among Native Americans in cardiac care and in many other areas. Uh, notably for today's session, um, he, his research on reconsidering the overall use of race as a factor in the practice of medicine, especially when allocating resources through algorithms, um, is part of his recent work. He is now pursuing three new projects on the evolution of coronary artery surgery, on heart disease and cardiac therapeutics in India, and on the threat of air pollution to health. He teaches the history of medicine, medical ethics, and social medicine at Harvard College and Harvard Medical School. Today, he's gonna to talk to us about the scope and likely clinical impact of race correcting in algorithms. Dr. Jones? Okay, thank you for the opportunity to speak today about the difficult challenges 
that race and racism pose for the uses of artificial intelligence in healthcare. Medicine, as many of you know, has a long history of racism, stretching back for centuries. <clears throat> Efforts to reckon with this history have intensified over the past year, in part because of the protests that followed the murder of George Floyd, and in part because of the ways that COVID has once again laid bare the scars of racism in America. Clinical medicine faces an especially difficult question. Should doctors treat patients of different races differently because of their race and ethnicity? They clearly do. Researchers have documented many regrettable cases in which disparities in medical treatment reflect structural, institutional, or interpersonal racism. I want to focus today on a different set of cases in which doctors treat people of different races differently, deliberately, because they think it is the medically correct thing to do. Race-based medicine often has a defensible logic. Researchers have documented race differences in disease prevalence and therapeutic outcomes. Clinicians, in response, have factored race into diagnostic tests, risk calculators, and treatment guidelines. Many of these race-adjusted tools direct medical attention towards white patients. This is perverse at a time when people of color suffer higher mortality rates from many diseases. Here is one tool, the STONE score, that predicts the risk of a kidney stone in someone with flank pain. The score assesses several factors with a high score indicating higher risk. If you look, you will notice that non-black race is weighted as heavily as having blood in your urine. This systematically assigns white people to a higher risk category and directs medical attention and resources, in this case a CAT scan, towards them. Here is another tool, one that predicts whether a pregnant person should attempt a vaginal birth after they've had a prior cesarean section. The researchers studied outcome data from over 7,000 women. They found several factors associated with a high risk of bad outcome, including weight, black race, Hispanic ethnicity, insurance status, marital status, and tobacco use. But when they put these findings into their risk category, in, into their risk calculator, they included weight, race, and ethnicity, but not the other factors, as if somehow they felt race was more important than the others. Last summer, I co-authored a paper with several colleagues about these practices of race adjustment, race correction, and race norming. We described 13 tools from different medical specialties. Several of these required on a very thin evidence base. Many of the tools rely on a dichotomous variable, black or non-black. We feared that these tools, if used as directed, would exacerbate health disparities. Now, tensions last summer about the, this issue of race correction were inflamed by allegations that the National Football League used race-specific norms for psychological tests in order to, to deny concussion settlements to retired Black players. These efforts prompted and energized congressional hearings and inquiries. The House Ways and Means Committee, for instance, issued a request for information. Many medical societies responded and re-examined their use of race and committed themselves to an anti-racist agenda. Several announced plans to stop using race in their clinical algorithms. Two of the most prominent tools, a kidney function test and the vaginal birth risk calculator, have now been reformulated without race. But race cannot be ignored. Health inequities are ubiquitous in medicine. We must study race and racism if we are to eradicate inequity. Medicine must learn how to be race conscious without being racist. Suppose researchers develop a tool that has a robust empirical justification for race adjustment, and suppose that that tool could alleviate health inequities. Would this be a case of appropriate race conscious medicine? Such tools certainly exist. Should they be used? Before answering that question, it is important to consider the possible harms of this kind of race based medicine. Now, this is a fundamental and ancient question, or there, there is a fundamental and ancient question underlying all of this. 
are humans basically the same or not? Medicine currently operates on the assumption that we are different and that doctors can improve outcomes by focusing on race differences. There certainly are many forms of genetic differences between humans. The most dramatic is between people who are XX or XY in their chromosomes, typically women or men. There are also subtler genetic differences between people of different ancestry. On average, people of the same genetic sex differ at 0.1% of their genetic loci. And some of the differences clearly do matter. Genetic variants can have powerful effects, such as the alleles that cause sickle cell disease or Huntington's disease. And there are many common diseases whose course and severity are influenced by genes. And yes, there are some medically relevant differences between people of different ancestries. Tay-Sachs disease is more common in people of Ashkenazi ancestry. Sickle cell trait is more common amongst people with West African ancestry. But there is a danger in applying these differences carelessly. Even though sickle cell trait is 25 times more prevalent in African Americans than in white Americans, most African Americans don't have it. It would be wrong to treat all African Americans differently because of a trait carried by a minority of them. How do genetic and racial differences actually matter? Or how much do they actually matter in routine clinical practice? This is an empirical question and I've never actually seen anyone produce a good answer. For instance, what percent of clinical encounters are significantly shaped by a genetic variant, especially one with a racial distribution? If you look at the most common causes of emergency room visits, chest pain, abdominal pain, back pain, headache, cough, shortness of breath, genetic factors might contribute, but they are not decisive. If you look at the leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, COVID, accidents, Genetic factors might again be relevant, but again, they are not decisive. Now I can assert, but cannot prove, that doctors could practice medicine just fine in most cases if they abandoned the use of race in their diagnostic tools and treatment guidelines. But if they do continue to use crude race categories like black versus non-black, they risk causing several forms of harm. And I'll talk about three, miscategorization, reification, and distraction. Miscategorization is the most obvious. Many of the race-based tools that are in practice rely on a black, non-black distinction, as if humans can be meaningfully divided into these two groups. Some clinical tools use five races and two ethnicities. Is any of this scientific or evidence-based? Someone who identifies as Hispanic might have ancestry that is 100% American, 100% African, 100% European, or any mix thereof. Is Barack Obama black or non-black? That's simply not the kind of question that doctors should be asking. In response to this concern, some researchers have begun to assert that race is useful not as a proxy for genetics, but as a proxy for racism. But imagine three patients that a clinician might meet, one descended from enslaved Africans, another a second generation Ethiopian immigrant, and a third a student from a wealthy family from West Africa. These people might have little in common in terms of their lived experiences of racism and little shared ancestry as well, but our healthcare system would label them as one type, black, distinct from all other humans. And this simply makes no sense. Reification is subtler. For centuries, scholars have debated whether race is a legitimate category, a natural kind. Substantial evidence now shows that human variation exists along gradual and continuous geographic gradients without demarcation between traditional race categories. It might be possible to develop sophisticated ways of classifying this variation. But instead of doing that, doctors continue to rely on traditional, that is to say 18th century, race taxonomies. This reinforces the popular belief that the old race categories are real, legitimate, and useful. And this exacerbates the divisiveness of race in America. The third harm is distraction. Medicine's reflexive use of race diverts attention from other factors that are relevant, possibly more relevant than genetics and race. Race is certainly a powerful force in American society, but so is class. Researchers have documented innumerable social determinants of health, income, zip code, marital status, environmental exposures, adherence rates, and countless others. Many of these have larger effect sizes than common genetic variants. Should we adjust diagnostic tests 
based on zip code? Should we initiate mammography earlier in poor women? I don't think anyone has asked or answered these questions like they have about race. Now, I certainly recognize that it is easier to criticize practices than to implement solutions, so I feel obligated before closing to make some specific recommendations. As I said earlier, I am not calling for colorblind medicine. As long as race and racism determine access to wealth, health, and social resources, we need to study them. I support race-conscious medicine. We just need to figure out the best way for medicine to be race-conscious. Medicine needs to begin by transforming its data and descriptive statistics. If we think human differences are important and should inform medical practice, then we need to invest the resources required to map and understand those differences. There are genetic alleles that influence disease risk and treatment outcomes. Some occur at different frequencies in people of different ancestries. But if we want to use that knowledge well, we cannot rely on the black versus non-black distinction. Instead, we need to develop better ways to measure and assess genetic variation. Meanwhile, whenever we see a need to specify genetics or ancestry, when we think difference is important, we should also collect and report high resolution data about the social determinants of health. They are likely to be more important than the genetic information. And it's not just current socioeconomic status that matters. We need to figure out a way to measure the integrated sum of social and economic exposures over a person's lifetime. Well, why does this matter for medical artificial intelligence? The traditional tools that I have described are developed by researchers who chose which data to collect, who performed linear regressions to determine the variables that correlated most closely with outcomes, and then they built those factors into their tools. Machine learning algorithms do something fundamentally similar. And since an algorithm, and not a human user, is determining what variables incorporate are incorporated, this reduces some forms of interpersonal bias, some forms of racism. But it does not solve the problem. As long as American health data sets obsessively incorporate data about race and ethnicity, while neglecting the socioeconomic status and other relevant exposures, then the AI algorithms will recapitulate social biases and conclude that race is important in medicine. Studies have already confirmed this. The Obermeyer study mentioned in the introduction described an AI tool that predicted the risk of death in sick patients. Since the tool considered healthcare spending, and since healthcare spending in the United States reflects forms of racism, the tool inadvertently built racism into its output. The best way to prevent this is to pay close attention to the data sets that fuel machine learning algorithms. We would ideally use data sets that either contain no markers of human difference to prevent, to prevent the instantiation of racism, or use data sets that contain extensive measures of both genetic differences and socioeconomic status so that we end up with a complete picture of what really matters. Yes, this will be hard to do, but human science has accomplished many hard things before. We sent 12 men to the moon and brought them back safely. We developed powerful COVID vaccines in just one year. Surely we can figure out how to move beyond crude categories of racial categorization. We need to commit to collecting more comprehensive data about patients in both research and clinical practice, and we need to develop clever ways to analyze this data. Our patients deserve better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for um, that wonderful presentation. Um, our next speaker, um, who is going to continue the discussion of how race influences medicine, is Dr. Faye Cobb Payton. Dr. Payton is a professor of information technology and analytics at North Carolina State University. Um, she and it was named University Faculty Scholar for her leadership in turning research into solutions to society's most pressing issues. Dr. Payton works on projects related to smart health and biomedical research in the area of artificial intelligence and advanced data science. She has spoken extensively on the risk of digital discrimination, exploring AI bias, artificial intelligence in healthcare and race, artificial intelligence and systemic inequities. Today, she is going to discuss the intended 
or unintended consequences of including race in clinical algorithms and how we can use AI to improve, not harm health for people from all racial backgrounds. Dr. Payton? Thank you. Thanks for inviting me today. So I'll put this disclaimer out. It is great to be here and we will go ahead and get started. So I will start with uh, some research findings from a group of colleagues and I who have been studying healthcare and particularly using large data sets to discover um, any insights on particular healthcare conditions. And I start with two, two very enthusiastic people, I'm sure many of, of whom you know. And this was our experience in the lab, thinking we got data, we got data. And by that, we were excited, we were ready to go out, do some analyses and draw some conclusions and come up with some recommendations. So we had the data, as Picard would say, and everyone has data, as Oprah would say. So study one, we took a look at the idea of diabetes in hospitalized patients. And our goal was actually to take a look at sex and race. And we were particularly interested in core morbid conditions, the degree to which diabetes exists, but other uh, health disparities or as uh, defined by the CDC are prevalent in a patient data set. Our team, as we're talking about the data, we started out with, as you can see, almost 48 million records, discharge records, over a huge latitude of time. And we were pretty adamant that we were going to be able to track patient A or patient B all the way through this time period from 2006 to 2011, as they had experienced in the intake process, and if they did have that experience, hospital experience. We whittled down, um, this is sort of a schematic to say, you know, we are not really going to um, look at anyone that's admitted for um, new birth or, or newborn delivery, anyone that is less than 18. Um, and as you can see, we had a number of discharges with missing values that were excluded. And I think there is something to be said about when we grab on and hold on to these data sets. The data, um, as you well know, comes with many different attributes. We were looking at age, gender, race, total cost, length of stay, and discharge disposition. What we found and what we learned was this. We came up with this schematic to sort of take a look at who has diabetes, who doesn't have diabetes? What are the core, core morbid conditions that cling to and with diabetes? Is it obesity? Is it heart disease? Is it mental health? We wanted to discern how this affected and infected those uh, based on their sex, based on race and ethnicity. What are the total charges, length of stay, and again, as we mentioned, uh, the disposition. This representation shows the relationship between variables and outcomes of interest. The population of interest was seg separated by these variables to represent sort of that intercircle. The primary variable of interest, core morbidity, is presented in the light gray. Variables in the following dark gray represented demographic variables while those in the black section represented the primary outcomes of interest, which are in this outer ring. What did we learn? We learned from our initial results, which took quite a bit of time, and hence why this is important when we are designing algorithms. Initially, we started out, as you could see, with that very large data set of over 47 a million, or right at 47 million. We were not able to use all of the data. We needed to take a step back. We needed to do some data scrub. We needed to ask questions around the comorbidities 
and the coding of ICD codes that were in the data. We learned that for a principal reason for hospitalization was that disparities in outcome for women and ethnic groups were persistent. We learned that ethnic groups have poor outcomes and are less likely to have routine discharges from the hospital. We learned that these disparities have persisted over the time horizon for the data sets that we had, suggesting that without conscious effort to personalize the care for women and diverse groups with diabetes, their outcomes are not likely to improve. We also determined and concluded that there could perhaps be a differential impact of diabetes, definitely between men and between women. Homogeneity in patients and core morbidities was rare or is rare given the variability of demographic characteristics. In other words, oftentimes an algorithm or as models are set up, they are looking at a specific disease condition. We wanted to know how did this impact length of stay and cost of care when other core morbid conditions can be present. We then took a look at a second set. Based on the diabetes study, we were interested in the same sort of, of uh, topology there, looking at the impact of mental disorders on HIV. By looking at these disorders, we came up with ICD-9 codes at the time and really learned, and this is something that we also learned from the diabetes study. When we're talking about data, when we're talking about how attributes are defined, when we're talking about fluctuation and changes in ICD codes, particularly in healthcare, having that longitudinal study for implications for the long run can be very difficult. We did run into these problems, particularly when we were talking about mental health. What we learned, and you can see here in the bowl, uh, to my left, your right, um, we found out that there was the existence of um, non-dependent abuse of drug, drug dependence, depressive disorder, um, mood disorders, all the way down to schizophrenia that really creeped up and weighed more into this model. The results of our principal components uh, analyses showed some of these disorders as primary conditions that actually had more weight in the model. What did we learn in this case? We learned in this case, and this case we learned longer length of stay and core morbid conditions do affect HIV patient outcomes. Mental health disorders generally result in a decrease in both length of stay and total charges. Patients with mental illnesses are more likely to be transferred to other facilities so that their true length of stay actually is not observed. We found that there was actually some disparity when we, of this when we looked at race and ethnicity. The most important conditions that bubbled up for this model were mental health disorders, and we placed the codes out here. Uh, mental disorders, mood disorders, depression, and anxiety. The key takeaway that we learned is that health services uh, and health services delivery approaches to adherence and treatment to better address chronic diseases and their severity along with the core morbidities are truly needed when it comes to race and race-based um, medicine. We turn to a more salient issue with another study, looking at, again, large data sets, this time using natural language processing and really looking at what have other studies done to inform us about how we deliver healthcare, particularly healthcare pre-COVID, I should note that this study is, to college students. What we learned is that uh, the majority of the research was focused on, not on age, not on race actually, 
but more so what are the services that were needed? Many a study were looking at what are the services that institutions can provide and how they can provide them to address, in fact, issues of age and race and crime and the aftermath of that impact of having a challenging experience on an institutional campus, as well as what are the issues around victimization that leads to mental health in the first place when it comes to our college students. When race inclusion or when race is excluded, what we know, and this was mentioned earlier by uh, Dr. Jones, um, but I wanna highlight some of this. Race blind algorithms may be well intended. Um, race blinded oftentimes can heighten disparate conditions and experiences as we found with the study of mental health and the study of diabetes. Race blinded actually heightens structural inequities that often go unacknowledged in an algorithm. Race blind, where healthcare costs as a proxy, um, as we know, Auger Minor and Group from the science publication, that the algorithm falsely concludes that black patients are healthier than equally sick white patients. In other words, fewer resources being spent on black patients who have the same level of need. Why does all of that matter? And so what is missing in the discussion? Healthy People 2020 points out the social determinants of health is based on five place-based domains. And I think these are the domains that are critical, even if the team and I were to go back and look at our results from earlier years. There is the economic stability, of uh, patient populations, variability in education, health versus health care, neighborhood and built environment. I think earlier Dr. Jones mentioned zip code, social and community context, um, very much in terms of discrimination being a key issue in the social and community context domain. While all of that is good, I do say, and I've often used this um, as a talking point and try to include this in the research, that big data, this was as a note from the Washington Post, big data was supposed to fix education. Like there was a lot of hope placed on big data in healthcare. It didn't fix education. It won't fix healthcare, but it's also time to have models that are sensitive to small data, small data being context, which are really important. What I mean by that is, here's a topic that we took a look at about how do we engage and how do we engage both from an algorithmic perspective, but also from a cultural perspective. While time won't, me, won't permit me to discuss all of this, the MyHealthCareImpactNetwork.org started out as a platform to have discussions with young people around health disparities. Uh, the infographics are out there to show what are the other issues salient of a binary on versus off, good versus black, bad, black versus white sort of construct. What are the other issues that actually come into play when it comes to understanding healthcare and healthcare outcomes. Historical context is critical. Think about the time period of the story for which you are running that algorithm, telling that story. What events are critical? We all know that we've had the trifecta of COVID, an economic downturn, and sort of racial strife here in the country. What could the author, what could you do in terms of using a historical context to plot, to impact your plot, your analyses, your implications, your recommendations? How does this inform the reader? Historical context matters. It is not just a data issue. I highlight these types of association biases that come into play 
when it comes to healthcare. It's not just a data set bias, there's association bias, there's automation bias, confirmation bias, and interaction biases. And lastly, I put up this, this was actually released, as you can see, a few days ago. While there is a lot of talk about health disparities and what algorithms could do, health equity and health disparities and the role of representation in the space do matter. Particularly when it comes to data science and decolonizing data and health disparities to tell the picture of who is designing the algorithms, what is the context, and is, uh, pop are there populations that are missing from the team? And this is my last slide. The lived experience and algorithmic bias, there are models of fairness that exist out there. But I'd say small data, social determinants of health, place and space, there must be an ecosystem thinking. Healthcare does not exist in a vacuum. Data sanitation, which we definitely learned in the studies that I talked about, the training data, the validation data, and the test data, all have implications for over and underfitting, which has impacts on populations. And again, context matters. Augmentation of AI findings relative to how the results will be interpreted and used and informing policymakers, all centered around the concept of design justice, centering race in, this, in design so that it will not be absent and it will not be overlooked. And with that, I will turn it over to you and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Payton, for such a powerful and insightful look um, at, this, at these really genuinely complex issues. Um, our next speaker, Mr. Rajiv Ronanke, is the Chief Digital Officer at Anthem Inc. Mr. Ronanke's experience spans over 20 years of innovation-driven industry and social change across healthcare and technology. Under the leadership of Anthem CEO, Gail Boudreau, Anthem embarked on what has been called a digital transformation just three years ago. Mr. Ronanke is leading that work to help Anthem become a digital platform for health that utilizes a multi-channel approach to connect consumers and providers um, to achieve this transformation. Mr. Ronanke drives the vision, strategy, and execution of Anthem's digital first approach across the organization's digital, artificial intelligence, exponential technology, service experience, and innovation portfolios. He is reimagining the future of healthcare by enabling Anthem to harness the power of AI and data. Today, he's going to talk about how healthcare organizations um, and, and plans can contribute to AI that advances health equity. Uh, Mr. Ronanke? Thank you, Sherry. Uh, pleasure to be here this afternoon with, uh, with all of you. Um, and I was glad that uh, Dr. Jones and Dr. Tay uh, preceded you know, my talk here because uh, um, it sets a, a great context to kind of how Anthem uh, is, is looking at this very you know, uh, uh, deep and um, I would say critical issue uh, at a population level. And, and the reason I say that is uh, Anthem is the second largest insurance company in the US. Uh, we cover 45 million lives. And um, as a result of our longitudinal relationship with, with the populations that we serve, we've got access to, to over 70 million uh, claims data for over 70 million lives. We've got access to clinical data for over uh, 15 million lives. And we've got uh, access to lab data for over 18 million lives. And we've got a wealth of uh, socially oriented data on where people live, work, play, and um, uh, their access to health related uh, or the drivers to health related, you know, uh, health issues, if you will, or social uh, drivers related to health issues. And through all of that, and, and by no means this, this, this number here that I've put up on the slide um, is, um, is necessarily peer reviewed and critically validated. But in all of the, 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 the analysis that we've done, uh, we found that uh, roughly 80% of uh, an individual's health outcome is determined by where they live 
uh, as opposed to a, a let's just say their their DNA or any other um, a health factor. Uh, so clearly, you know, all the things that uh, we we just talked about are, are critically uh, important to sort of driving um, uh, health equity and uh, you know using all of our techniques and all of our interventions at our disposal in order to to address it uh, holistically. Uh, but um, you know, before we dive into that, you know, let's maybe set some context, right? So you know, as I said, you know, a lot of the you know health-related you know issues are driven by um, where, where we live, work, and play. Uh, where we live, you know, for instance, uh, Dr. Fay, you know, talked about um, economic disparities um, and, you know, other social factors, but breaking that down a level, what that means is, you know, where you live, does it have access to affordable and nutritious food? Are they um, adequate recreation and exercise options? Is there access to, to medical care? Uh, are they, uh, you know, the pollution levels in the, in the air and the water, um, and there's a reliable transportation. All of these things, um, you know, have a, a huge impact on on, uh, on health, as do uh, where we work. Um, and uh, does the place that you work, does it provide health insurance coverage? You know, does it uh, provide and focus on uh, whole, whole health issues, connecting in primary clinical needs with uh, behavioral health issues? as well as accounting for, for all the things that, that create, you know, uh, stress and other things in our life, uh, leading to the health-related outcomes and health-related issues. And ultimately, you know, social uh, factors of health. Our friends, our family, uh, are we lonely? Uh, do we have a, a good support system? And uh, what kind of, 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 of behaviors uh, is that driving? Um, healthy behaviors, or is it driving uh, unhealthy behaviors like eating uh, unhealthy foods, drinking and smoking, uh, all of these things uh, have a have a role to play in uh, in our health outcomes. So the role of artificial intelligence then, right? So given given the wealth of data and given uh, the, the the fact that data is growing at an exponential pace, and in our own uh, research it shows that um, Anthem's data set roughly uh, you know doubles every 73 to 80 days. So it's impossible for, for humans to, to keep pace, you know, with the exponential uh, growth of this data. Uh, so enter artificial intelligence. Um, it's it's a, a long, well-established field. Uh, it's been around for uh, 40 plus years, and it's it goes um, more and more mature, you know, by the day, by the week, by the year. Uh, but a lot more um, to be, you know, done in terms of uh, responsible and the ethical use of artificial intelligence in order to address the the, the very many things that, that we're talking about. Uh, so how do we actually apply uh, AI and how do we correlate it back to, um, uh, to the issues that, that I just, just referenced around uh, driving more health equity and, and improving access to care and using all of this data ultimately to drive better health outcomes? So here's just a few examples of how Anthem is, is, uh, is making that happen. So first up, we've got something that we call our a, a data platform for social determinants of health. And, and that platform and you can click on that URL to, to get a sense for what that looks like for you uh, in a public setting. But the private version of that combines uh, where we live, work, and play, and all of the associated data around that with our clinical data, with our, um, clinic, with our claims data and our labs data, and increasingly uh, data from our devices to create uh, a number of predictions. And today we're able to uh, predict roughly about uh, 4,000 unique things about a person's uh, future healthcare journey. Everything from the likelihood of developing an opioid substance abuse disorder or developing a chronic condition like hypertension or, or diabetes in the future to uh, the risk of falling, the risk of skipping an appointment, the risk of missing uh, a, a critical uh, you know, gap in care and uh, ultimately uh, suffering a worse consequence as a, result, as a result. So what do we do with all these wealth of insights? You know, collectively, we have over 2 billion such insights. And uh, there's two ways in which we're, we're activating and uh, making use of these predictions. One is through our partnership with our, um, with our provider network, uh, which comprises of primary care physicians, caregivers, um, you know, physician extenders, nurse practitioners, uh, of course, hospital systems, um, home health uh, providers, and the entire gamut of the healthcare uh, care delivery infrastructure. 
And through our relationship with a broader care delivery infrastructure, we're integrating our insights into uh, the electronic medical records and other points of data and workflow in a physician's office or a hospital system to get them to see the whole picture of health. And uh, it, those are oftentimes clinical insights, uh, but more and more they're about um, you know social insights about that relate to uh, fairness, equity, and uh, conclusions that that physicians might draw purely based on uh, race, ethnicity, and uh, you know gender, and you know some of the basic things that are used today. But looking beyond and saying, uh, does this patient that I'm seeing have access to transportation? Come see me for my next appointment. Or does this person have enough time, you know, in their day to, to spend their time exercising and, and sleeping well and and looking after themselves in a way that that would address, um, you know, their their medical and their behavioral and their their social you know, well-being. You know, put all put, put all that into the hands of the clinician so that you know not only can they you know treat what's presented, uh, but also look beyond and, and look at the whole picture of health and uh, you know, take care of that in their uh, workflows. So while presenting this information itself uh, is useful, uh, what we've uh, also come to realize is that um, uh, to truly make this actionable and have the providers be a part of this, this uh, uh, closed loop sort of mechanism for, for taking care of these interventions is to actually incent them to, to do just that. Uh, so to do that, we've created uh, and expanded our, our value-based care programs where we align the incentives and the outcomes for each provider uh, based on the number of actions that they're taking on the insights that are being created by our, our algorithms. And we want them that we want both the feedback on what's working and what isn't. So if they're taking action and they're seeing an improvement, we want that feedback to come back to us so that we can uh, continue to soft optimize our algorithms as well as um, if they feel that the insight that we're surfacing is not relevant and uh, is not appropriate for that particular patient, we also want to understand uh, why that's the case. And, um, and then also use that to continually you know, optimize and refine our algorithms. So, that's, so think of that as like one you know, bookend of a, of a platform that needs to be in place. The other is uh, the direct activation with our, with our members, our consumers, which happens through our, our digital apps and our, our assets, as well as uh, our clinical and customer service teams, which which interact with with our consumers, and um, you know, as you would imagine, uh, as a large insurance company, we get uh, you know hundreds of millions of interactions that happen. Uh, you know, some that happen digitally. About 60 to 70 percent of our interactions with our members happen through digital channels, and about 30 percent of them happen through our our, um, our contact centers. So regardless of which channel our members are are reaching out to us on, or we're reaching out to them uh, through. Uh, the um, the intent is that with every interaction, we want to understand the context in which we're resolving an issue. So if a customer is calling us about a, um, let's say, an administrative issue about the status of a claim or a, 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 a particular benefit or a copay or what have you, uh, we always want to correlate that to, you know, what is the, the, the related set of docs that we should be connecting? You know, do they, are they missing an appointment or are they... Uh, programs that we should be enrolling them into and making them aware of it so that um, we're raising the education level of, of the collective membership that we're, we're caring for and serving, as well as we're providing uh, recommendations to our, our provider network on the specific actions uh, that they ought to be taking. And in so doing, we want to create this virtuous cycle where uh, providers are intended to do the right thing based on our insights. Uh, our members are, are also incented uh, through, um, for example, eliminating copays and, and providing rewards and, and loyalty program and doubling points in some cases to take certain actions uh, based on the, uh, the whole set of insights that uh, our algorithms are, are surfacing. But in so doing, there's a, a critical dependency of making sure that we're accounting for things like bias. Uh, we're accounting for uh, data quality issues uh, in our underlying data sets to make sure that um, uh, the insights that we're servicing are actually representative of the complete population and that we're not missing anything because we're simply uh, using machine learning techniques to learn from perhaps what's an embedded bias in the system already. Uh, so, you know, to that end, uh, we've created, you know, something that we call the Office of Responsible Use of AI and um, 
in ethics. And uh, you know, this this group continuously looks at data, you know, but tests for bias as well as uses several other techniques to, to make sure that uh, these things are used in a responsible and, and scalable manner. So um, in a future that uh, is so so much technology centric and uh, is going to be leveraging data and AI in, in such a scale manner, our view is that uh, we've got to use technology in a way and AI in a way that elevates the human experience. Uh, so to that end, our strategy is to really use um, these technologies to automate as much of the uh, uh, the administrative process in our system as we can, uh, freeing up enough time across the system, whether it's the physician's time, freeing them up from having to rely on their electronic medical records you know, more than necessary, or any of the, the 85,000 people that work for Anthem uh, to, to, to focus almost exclusively on what are the things that need to be um, considered in balance of whole health and spend their time there versus resolution of a claim status or a billing issue or a, a prior auth that needs to be decided on. All of those things could be uh, automated and decided on, decided on by algorithms. And then the rest is where uh, we want to focus our time on and, and so do, you know, elevate the, you know, the human to human interaction and the human connection. Uh, so uh, with that, I will turn it back over to you, Sherry. Uh, thank you for your for your time and uh, appreciate uh, being on this panel today. Thank you very much, Mr. Ronenke. And um, Dr., I really appreciate your presentation. Doctors Jones and Mr. Ronenke are going to be able to stay with us. Um, Dr. Payton, if you have a moment, she, uh, Dr. Payton has to leave us exactly at 2 o'clock. One of the questions that, that was directed to you um, that, that was asked by several people is what is the most effective way to include data about communities at the community and grassroots diverse level um, in AI uh, systems? Yeah, I get asked that question all the time. I think, um, you know, I would say this, there are a number of strategies that you can use and one is, um, one is a very ground roots approach, grassroots approach. Um, you need to involve community in the process, um, you know, the Urban Institute has laid out, I think, some very systematic steps from the research um, that they have done to sort of outline how do you get community involved. So I think community involvement is is one. I think secondly, it it, it requires gaining trust, not assuming that trust, and that trust building. Sherry, is a process, right? And I think um, that is clearly important. I think um, having more um, inclusive, diverse people um, designing, implementing, interpreting, creating policy is very important um, because, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Dr. Jones mentioned was, you know, one's zip code and understanding the zip code. Um, what does that mean? So I'll give you just, just one little simple data point, then I'll stop. Um, I would hate for someone to have made decisions over the course of my lifetime based on the zip code that I grew up in. I was most likely, and friends and I always talk about it, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be in the platform. We'd still be subjects of, of studies. And so I think understanding context, inviting community to be in, and this idea, and, and this is a very simple one, which is somewhat takes a lot of work, data literacy and uh, democratizing the data such that community understands um, what the data mean and don't mean um, is, is, um, is very important in these days. The next kind of uh, literacy divide, in my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Payton. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, and thank you again for joining us today. Um, Dr. Jones, we've had uh, uh, several questions about um, what type of data to use. And we also have a question about um, the quality of data, uh, overcoming the lack of, of appropriate self-reported data um, and, and assessing and correcting for bias in, in, in data that scales to larger uh, data sets. Could you address that? 
Yeah, the it sounds like the data we want to use is the kind of data that insurer com, insurance companies, for instance, have. And when I when I heard heard Rajiv uh, Renanke talking about the kind of data they had access to, I think there are a lot of researchers who are very jealous uh, and would very much like to have that kind of data. Uh, because what you, need, you 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 don't want to just have a few data points to judge someone's medical fate on the basis of their skin color is clearly wrong. As Faye Payton was saying, to reduce someone to their zip code is clearly wrong. What you need is multifaceted data on many, many factors of a person's uh, background, possibly their ancestry, not just where they live now, but where they have lived previously, their education. There's lots of stuff you, you need to know. And a lot of medical researchers will say that it's too, it's too hard to collect all that. But there are people who are managing to do that. There's a tremendous amount of information that's in health data sets, whether held by hospitals or insurers. And we need to get better at using it. And it sounds like Anthem, at least, is taking good steps towards doing so. Um, and the other thing we have to be careful of is not generalizing. Just because people who live in one, one area are, are often a certain way doesn't mean that everyone who lives in that zip code is that way. Just because there are some traits that are more common in people of color than people who are white, it doesn't mean we should assume that all people of color have those traits. So we need to collect very good data very expansive data, and we need to be very careful in how we apply it to specific individuals. Thank you, um, and thank you, Dr. Jones, um, for your overall presentation and, and perspective. Um, we have time for one last question. Um, and Ms. Ranamke, we have a question about how can a company develop a culture that that addresses bias and data and and learns to co to collect data in an unbiased way. Um, could could you um, address that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and to uh, 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 maybe answer a question that perhaps uh, Dr. David Jones was was asking, uh, we do have uh, something that we call a, a data sandbox. Uh, that is a subset of our data, and it is available to researchers. So if anyone's interested in in um, researching on our data sets, uh, please do reach out and I will be happy to, to uh, onboard you onto that. Um, as far as the, uh, the, the culture question, uh, Shuri, it's, it's, it's about, I think, starting with the assumption that uh, there is bias in everything we do and it's always existed. Uh, the issue that we have with uh, you know, the, the present state of technologies is that we can scale it very quickly and that bias, which was limited by human scale before when it translates to machine scale could reach um, you know hundreds of millions millions of people in an instant and that's the danger you know so i think what we do at anthem is to assume that every every single thing whether it's automating a business process or providing a recommendation to a clinician on a, a particular um, uh, care related topic uh, we assume that there is a uh, inherent uh, bias embedded within whatever we're developing. So what we then do is, with, with that assumption, we test for how do we uh, improve that. And, and part of it is through understanding the quality of the data and filling in gaps you know, with uh, synthetic and other data sources that's where needed. And then uh, being willing to, to pull the plug on initiatives that don't pass that muster, regardless of of the of the financial cost at the end of the day. And um, it's a hard thing, easy thing to say and a hard thing to do, uh, because there's a lot. You know, once you kick off a project and you've invested hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars into it, uh, then as you discover that uh, you know perhaps you know the, the quality assumptions aren't right or the quality of the data isn't uh, to a level where we can use that at scale. Uh, then the responsible thing to do is to not roll it out and wait until you know we've remediated the issues and addressed it. And that uh, oftentimes is the hardest thing to do at a big enterprise, which is to to stop an initiative and, and and kill it or or adjust it and pivot it. Or if something is already in production and you discover an issue and you got to take it offline, and clearly you can imagine the, the the coordination and the logistics that are needed in order to to make something like that happen. Uh, not to mention uh, the, the regulatory, legal, and other issues to, that we have to deal with as well. So I think uh, education, ed educating all the right stakeholders, being transparent and open, uh, enlisting the, the help of the, the ecosystem. Uh, so not all the answers are within a company, but uh, uh, I think the broader community can, can help a lot in, in addressing those issues. So 
enlisting uh, a broader ecosystem uh, can often help. Uh, but it starts, I think, with the mindset that uh, you know the, the, this whole space is a work in process, and uh, you know there are a lot of lessons to be learned uh, in how how to make this happen, and be willing to accept that uh, a sign of failure of of uh, in in, uh, in an algorithm, which is perhaps interpreted as as the presence of bias, uh, means that you know you now have something tangible to act on, so it should be viewed as learning uh, as opposed to failure and uh, incorporated into kind of future iterations and future generations of that algorithm. Uh, so it's a lot more work to be done. It's one that I'd say that everyone should be looking at a, at a community ecosystem outside the boundaries of any one enterprise you know, based approach, you know, because this is a far too important issue uh, to be addressed just by one company alone. Thank you very much, Mr. Ronanke. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time uh, for our Q&A. First, I want to thank our, our wonderful speakers uh, for taking time out of their schedules to be with us today. Um, and I want to ask our audience to please take a moment to share feedback on the event when our survey pops up. And also visit the NICM website to look at our extensive public health resources. Later this week, you will all be getting an infographic on the topic of today's webinar to share or republish. In a few days, you will get a copy of the webinar. And please look for our upcoming webinar on the impact of long COVID on health. Thanks again for sharing your afternoon with us um, and goodbye.